Lecture 26, The Anabaptists, 1. Professor Williams of Harvard calls the Anabaptists the radical Reformation, as Krauth called, as we saw, the Lutherans, the conservative Reformation. As we've already indicated, I think, the uh, Reformation had a kind of unity about it, but there were different degrees of emphasis. The Lutheran was more conservative than the Calvinistic, and the Anabaptist was, more, uh, was less conservative than the uh, Calvinists, and we are focusing now on the Anabaptist radical uh, reformation, strictly speaking, more radical than either the Lutheran or the general Calvinistic. Two, we might call the Anabaptists the unconservative reformation, perhaps. Certainly they didn't begin to preserve what the Lutheran and the Calvinists, but especially, we've already noticed where they're unconservative, the church state liaison that Rome and Lutheranism and Calvinism still tended to preserve was absolutely taboo by the Anabaptists. And that caused a strain we've already noticed with Zwingli because they could see the Anabaptists underlining st undermining church uh, state support and the military power that went, uh, uh, went with it. Now, that's not only a, a radical uh, departure from the main line, Protestant uh, reformers, but it is a threatening one. And you can see why all forms of reformation as well as Romanism were hostile to these people because they threatened the main support on which all of them were actually uh, relying. Number three, they were the thorns in the side of Lutheranism and Calvinism as well as Catholicism. What made these people radical and yet a part of the Reformation? Five, their radicalism was their Anabaptism. Second, baptizing of those already baptized in infancy. Infant baptism is one thing that all mainline Reformations preserve from the early and medieval church without, except for Lutheranism, the baptismal regeneration. Uh, we've already mentioned in connection with Twingley and his troubles with the Anabaptists that uh, they were called Anabaptists because they baptized again and that uh, I, I drew a distinction at that point that I'd like to develop a little more now. Infant baptism was advocated by Rome and by the Protestant groups as well, but infant regeneration which was advocated by Rome, was rejected by the Protestants generally, except the Lutherans, through Luther, came around to it in a fairly subtle way. Now, I would say with respect to the Anabaptists, who reject both the infant baptism and the infinite infant regeneration, do so fundamentally and with the relentless vehemence they always exhibited apropos this particular uh, doctrine. They are objecting to this because of this and even where a group such as the Calvinists, for example, would champion infant baptism and deny infant regeneration or baptismal regeneration, as far as the Anabaptists were concerned, they did regard the children as Christians. This was a bad thing, according to the Anabaptists. It made it possible to become a Christian without making a profession of faith. Do you get me at this point? They're saying, we're aware. No, they weren't always too aware. They weren't the scholars that the reformers were generally. But we're aware, on the whole, that some of you deny infant regeneration. And we're glad of that. But nevertheless, as long as you keep infant baptism, there's almost a built-in, inescapable danger of regarding these children, even when you don't say they're regenerate, as Christians. And consequently, you don't work for their conversion. Consequently, you assume they have been converted. And the first thing you know, you have a civil Christianity. And everybody born in Switzerland is a Christian because he was baptized in infancy.
were born in England, belongs to the Church of England because he was baptized in infancy. And the seriousness of that in the mind of the Anabaptists was the fact that these little children were taken as Christians when you had no basis for it, if you didn't try to evangelize them, they'd actually perish. Now, at this particular point, the Reformed should have had a sympathy for that. You see, they admit that danger. The Reformed generally, since they denied infant, infant gener regeneration, did not believe that the children were little saints. They were little sinners, and they needed to be converted. And the church was not going to let up on the endeavor to win them to Jesus Christ. But the tendency was built into the situation to think of them as little Christians ra rather than little sinners, people who are already, for all practical purposes, regenerated even though you don't affirm. I don't know whether you get me or not. I'm not too coherent on this. I'm, I admit it's in a little bit complicated. Let me go over this again. Uh, you can sense the kind of sympathy that I have here for the Anabaptists with whom I don't agree at this point because they are appointing to something uh, which is easily abused in the Reformed tradition and has been constantly abused. Let me go over it once again more slowly. The Anabaptists are saying infant baptism and infant regeneration is a very sinful doctrine. We admit that you have reduced the major offense when you eliminate infant regeneration or baptismal regeneration. That's fine. Even though you baptize infants, which you ought not to do, you still recognize them as unregenerate little sinners who need to be evangelized and need to be saved. You don't fall into the trap of these other people who just wait for their confirmation when the Spirit comes upon them in fuller day, but consider them little Christians so that if they are baptized, even in the mother's womb, before they've been fully delivered, they're born again and will go to heaven and so on. But, this is what they were saying, but even though you avoid that mistake, and even though you have associated with infant baptism the idea that the little children still need to be converted, the tendency is to act as if they were elect or even actually regenerated, and you fall into that horrible pit of regarding everybody who is born in a Christian family as a Christian, and you lose all real concern for their evangelism. Now, I'm say, speaking as a pedo-baptist who says, that's a terrible abuse. And if that happens, that is uh, very, very serious, and it must not be allowed to happen. And I admit at the same time, it often does happen in spite of the doctrine. So we'll take uh, uh, a warning, as it were, from our Anabaptist friends at this point. We'll first of all tell them we don't teach that, but we'll thank them for warning us that we may act as if we do. And I'll do my part, and you do your part to warn people who baptize infants that they have not been regenerated thereby, they need to be converted. In the old credos, you'd, the child was presented, the parents would promise to teach the child its lost condition by nature and lead it to the Savior. And as a pedo-baptist, I'm saying to the Baptist, that's what we believe, that's what we're instructing our people, and if we find them tending to fall into the idea that the child has been saved because it's baptized, we'll warn them. No, you teach the child its lost condition, not its saved condition by nature, and you do everything in your power to lead the child to the Savior. And strictly speaking, the danger the, the Anabaptists point out is not necessary, but it can easily be fallen into, and we must be careful not to be guilty of this abuse. Number five. Their radicalism was their Anabaptism, second baptizing of those already baptized in infancy. Mainline reformers preserved the early and medieval church without, except for Lutheranism, the baptismal regeneration. Number six, the Anabaptists rejected not only baptismal regeneration but infant baptism itself, thus antagonizing the Reformation as well as Catholicism. Both groups were driven to make martyrs of these radical reformers, and they particularly gruesome way of drowning because they insisted usually on immersion and insisting of people being baptized who had already been baptized. And this is a kind of a joke one doesn't appreciate very much.
least of all the Anabaptists, but even the people who were, I mean, if you, if you felt you had to execute these people because they were a danger to the state, somehow or other they ought to have resisted any gruesome kind of joke of executing them by baptism, but they were baptized in the Limot Quay right there in Zurich and so on. One of the very first friends of Twingley was, and many others later on in various parts of Europe were not only executed, but they were executed by drowning as well. But now, uh, I guess um, I needn't say anything more on that uh, point here. Let's go to number seven. The other distressing for the reformers feature of Anabaptism was its separatism. Lutheranism and Calvinism did not consider themselves as separating from Rome, but Rome as separating from them. They were the continuation of biblical and earlier Christianity. Papalism had left essential Christianity. Remember I had pointed out that John Calvin, when he wrote his institutes and dedicated them to the king of France, he pointed out in that dedication that this was not a separatist movement. This was not a break from Christianity. It was Rome, which was the breaker. I think the very outset of this course, I mentioned to you that uh, the pattern of Christian history was this. God chose Israel to be his people, and they constituted the church at that time. But at the time of Jesus Christ, when he came to his own, his own received him not. And ultimately, those who received him not were rejected by him. And what we have, therefore, is Israel, well, let's do it the other way, Israel turning away from the truth in which they had been established. They were prepared for the coming of the Messiah, and they were to prepare the world for it. But when the Messiah came, came to his own, they received him not. So the true church is not a continuation of Israel. Israel has departed from the church around A.D. 70, when God finally rejected them as a believing people, except for those individuals who actually embrace the gospel and become Jewish Christians. The book of Hebrews was written to those people primarily to try to warn them that when their fellow unbelieving Jews tried to bring them back from Christianity, they were in great peril of succumbing to that threat or to that invitation, and they would be hopelessly lost if they turned away from Jesus Christ to this false religion which was, continue, was claiming to be a continuation of the revelation of God in the Old Testament, which was, as a matter of fact, a turning away. Now, during the Middle Ages, the Christian church, of course, expanded more and more as it conquered the barbarians and other people. Now we come to the Reformation era. And what happens here with Martin Luther declaring justification by faith alone, the article by which the church stands and falls, and the Roman church, which was rejecting that. Well, according to Calvin and according to Luther, the Protestant church continued in the path of the Old Testament and the medieval church, and it was the Roman church which turned away, as we will see when we come to study the Council of Trent, they turned away from this basic tradition. They didn't reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God as the Jews did. They still confessed to believe in him as the Son of God, but they rejected his way of salvation and the authority of his word, which they took over... Or, for their authority because they insisted they were the only ones who could actually interpret it and so on. But what they're saying to the age in which they live is, we are not separate. And what Calvin is saying to King Francis I is, we're not break-offs, we're not separatists. It's actually the larger body which is separated. To be sure, in 1215 came the seven sacraments, and this group is keeping the seven sacraments. To be sure, earlier than, the, than that, the sacrifice of the Mass was introduced. And they're keeping that. And there are other things that they are keeping, the perpetual virginity of Mary and so on. But what are they? They're all errors. These aren't biblical doctrines. These are points at which the medieval church was turning away from the gospel. And what's happening now in the Reformation period is when people appear who are calling the church back, 
to biblical truth and away for errors, the majority of them are hanging on to the errors and rejecting the biblical truth, such as justification by faith alone. Now, we are faithful to what the Bible said, and we are continuing in the tradition of Christianity. It's the Jews who broke away in the first century. They're the separatists. It's the Roman Catholics who are breaking away in the 16th century. They are the separatists. We are not separatists, and don't classify us with that. And you Anabaptists, don't say that just because we don't buy all your package and agree with all that you think must be maintained and broken away with it. We ourselves not faithful to the truth once for all given to the Holy Church. Number eight, these reformers saw no justification for anti-pedo baptism or anti-civil government. See, they're saying to these people who are accusing them of not being faithful to the gospel once for all delivered, that these doctrines that you're introducing as tests of fidelity are not sound ones. Nothing in the Bible which rules out the possibility of a liaison with church and state. Nothing in the Bible which is against infant baptism and so on. You are the ones who are separating, really, uh, doctrines which are not essential. You're with us in the main principles of justification by faith alone. You really belong to us. You're a part of the Reformation, even though you're a radical part of the Reformation. Now, please, don't make these things which are actually non-essential and false, it wouldn't destroy you, essential, and actually make you separate from the true church on non-essentials, which does destroy you. I mean, you can't separate just because you want to. Now, of course, if you conscientiously believe it's a sin to baptize infants, you can't baptize infants. But you get my point here. You see, the question about separatism, the Roman church, the Jewish church insists we broke away from the Old Testament. That's false. The Roman church thinks we broke away from the church in the 16th. That's all false. These other radical separatists think we broke away from the church because we didn't see some of their particular doctrines. Our reply to that is, first of all, we don't agree those doctrines are there, but even if they were, they wouldn't be so essential as to justify a separation from the Reformation, which is virtually what you're doing uh, here. We'll come to that later. I admit that's a pretty brief uh, uh, allusion to a much more serious issue. Number nine, nor did they see any justness in the Anabaptist claim of a pure church. We've already mentioned the objection to the idea of, uh, of uh, believers' baptism exclusively and so on, and to this opposition to liaison between church and state and so on. But what might well have been the heart of Anabaptist uh, thinking is this doctrine of a pure church. And I'm saying here now that about the reformers, nor did they see any justness in the Anabaptist claim of a pure church, which Augustine, a millennium earlier, had proven unbiblical and impossible. Pure church. It's probably the most basic principle in the Anabaptistic uh, theology of the Reformation. Uh, you've already heard me comment on their opposition to infant baptism was a real and important one, but in my opinion, probably what distressed them most about the practice of infant baptism is that it led people and the church in general to suppose that the baptized children were real Christians. Even when they didn't affirm the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, and even when they weren't believing that the child was changed by the rite of baptism, still a tendency to, seemed to be built into the situation to treat the children as if they were real Christians, and then they grew up, and no matter how they thought or believed, they were still counted members of the church. And you had a real corruption of Christian society on that ground, and the possibility of a pure church ceased to exist. In other words, to put it in a sentence, perhaps the Anabaptists were so deeply distressed about infant baptism, not so much because of the error itself as because it tended to undermine the possibility of a pure church, which was the great ideal of the Anabaptists. They entertained the idea, which was admirable in itself, 
that we should aim at a perfect, pure church. And nobody will fault them on that. It is not legitimate to aim at anything else. The Church of Jesus Christ is supposed to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, their perfect model. And if they did so, they would be a perfect church. And they certainly ought to aim at that. Now, on that particular point, all of the reformers were in perfect unanimity with the Anabaptists, that that was the proper ideal. They are not faulting them on that point at all, but the Anabaptists did something in the second place which really spoiled everything, and that was they thought they achieved it. They thought they could and did achieve a pure church, or pure churches, as the case may be. They thought they could have a church which was made up of nothing but regenerate members. The children were not a part of it. Until the children actually embraced Christianity, they couldn't be considered Christians, and no adult could come into the church unless he professed faith in Christ and was living a life of godliness in him. Now, this was splendid, to aim at a pure church, but to think that you could achieve it and that you actually did achieve it was contrary to the teaching of the Bible in the opinion of the Reformed Church. It was very analogous in their thinking to the view which we should have of our personal sanctification. We're under a command to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, so if anyone is a Christian, <coughs> he must be aiming at pure Christianity, perfect behavior, perfect doctrine, and so on. That is splendid, and he ought to aim at the same thing in his church. But he is taught by the Bible to pray, forgive us our debts. The greatest apostle, Paul, probably had more of the Spirit of Christ than any man, didn't consider himself to have attained. He was striving to achieve the calling, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The great mistake of the Anabaptists was not their emphasis on a pure church or their warning against a state church, which took it for granted that everybody was a member of the church and so on, but their supposing that it could be achieved, and the Bible teaches plainly that the church has tares as well as wheats, and they cannot be removed, and that the individual Christian, though he must be striving for sanctification, never can achieve it. Now that you could go so far as to say, if you didn't agree with the Anabaptists on your aim for a pure and perfect church and a pure and perfect Christian person, you couldn't be a Christian, but you have to warn the Anabaptists that if they think you can achieve it and actually fall into the error of supposing that you have achieved either a perfect person or a perfect church, then you're in danger of not being a Christian at all. This is as Christian as it can be. This is as anti-Christian as it can be. The irony of the situation is, as I say here in item number 10, the reformers saw themselves in a mighty, difficult, and dangerous struggle to preserve the Christian church. When along comes a protesting group full of error itself and yet separating on the ground of having a pure church. I think you'll all admit that may be another instance of ultimate irony that we have seen in the long history of the Church of Jesus Christ.